everyone here this evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Looking forward to a wonderful time together tonight. Take your songbook and let's start by singing together. Number 575, Sunlight, I Wandered in the Shades of Night Till Jesus Came to Me. 575 in your songbook. And let's stand together to sing, all right? Brother Bob's going to lead us. On that first together. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love with him. Let's sing that middle stanza. While walking in the light of God, I sweet communion find. I press with holy vigor on and leave this world behind. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight. Since the Savior found me, I have had the sunlight of his love with it on the last soon i shall see him as he is light that came to me behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity sunlight sunlight in my soul today sunlight sunlight all along the way since the savior found me took away my sin i have had the sunlight of his love with him all right good singing let's have a word of prayer together shall we and check on this uh mr sound man listen to me it doesn't sound quite right tonight so make sure that's where it's supposed to be all right thank you father thank you for this evening now thank you for another opportunity for us to gather together here in the middle of the week and thank you for each one who's made their way here on a wednesday night and Lord, we bow before you here at the beginning of our service and ask you to meet with us in a special way. You know what we need this evening and uh, pray you meet the need of our heart tonight. I bless the music and our fellowship together, uh, the giving back to you, a portion of what you've given to us, and of course, the study of your word this evening. May your hand be upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 228 as you find your seats 228 if you from sin are longing to be free look to the Lamb of God 228 we're going to sing that first second and last stanza together if you from sin are longing to be free look to the Lamb of God he to redeem you tied on Calvary look to the Lamb of God Look to the Lamb of God, look to the Lamb of God, for He alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. When Satan tempts and doubts and fear assail, look to the Lamb of God. You in His strength shall over all prevail look to the lamb of god look to the lamb of god look to the lamb of god for he alone is able to save you look to the lamb of god fear not when shadows on your pathway fall Look to the Lamb of God. Enjoy your sorrow, Christ is all in all. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the Lamb of God. For he alone is able to save you. Look to the Lamb of God. Great singing tonight. Let's go over to number 40. 40, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Number 40. We'll sing all three stanzas together. 
<clears throat> On that first, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path rose from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm. I'm leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread, what have I to fear, leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Well, our missionary letter tonight is for, from the uh, Wallace family, missionaries in Mexico. Dear Pastor Slayball and Bible Baptist Church, I want to begin by thanking you for your prayers and support which, which make possible the spread of the gospel in Mexico City. I never want to get used to being a Christian or accustomed to being saved. Neither do Mary and I ever want to take for granted your involvement in our ministry. As furlough has come to an end, we want to thank the pastors and churches who have allowed us to present our ministry and give an update. We also appreciate the hospitality, fellowship, and generosity we received in our travels. We enjoyed recently being able to be with our daughter, daughter Hannah, and her family at our home church during their mission conferences. We also were able to see our sons, Stephen and Joseph, and his family a few times on furlough. Joanna and Joseph are expecting their third child, a girl, in August, and that will be our fifth grandchild. We just returned from Mexico City a few days ago as we went there to find a new apartment and a new area to plant a new church. We return there in about one and a half weeks after we get our van nationalized in Mexico on the border. We already have our first group scheduled to come and visit us in November and are excited about that. If you or a couple or a family or a small church group would like to come for a mission trip, we would love to have you. Just let us know. We did find an apartment last week, but it wasn't where we thought it would be. We could not find any semi-safe apartments near the new area we feel God has called us to, but our new apartment is in a different area and a place where we felt the Lord wanted us to plant another church one day. I believe from this apartment during this term, God might allow us to plant two churches, one where we felt led this term as well as another in the area we'll be living. This new area is also close to the Jews to allow us to continue the outreach ministry to them, as well as close to the orphans to allow us to continue ministering to them. Apart from these two ministries, please continue to pray for the other new ministries God has put on our hearts. That's schools, military bases, hospitals, soccer fields, drug and alcohol rehabilitation centers, radio, etc. By the way, if the Lord tarries, I have a list of about 10 places in our general area of the city that need a church but doesn't have one. I hope the Lord allows us to plant, plant probably two each term unless he returns first. By the way, there are more places throughout Mexico City that needs churches. If the Lord might be dealing with you about missions or the ministry, though I might never be able to reach these other areas, I'd be glad to help show them to you and help you start a work there. 
if the Lord would call you to missions in Mexico, specifically the area of Mexico City. During our visit last week, apart from hunting apartments, we were able to visit Hope Baptist Church, Iglesia Bautista Esperanza, that started in 2016. They are doing well. Just before we left for furlough last year, Juan Carlos began to attend church, as did Fernanda. When, they, when we were there last week, they said, you are our pastor when we got saved and baptized, each of us, and we want to get married. So we will have a wedding for them, maybe in late June. There's another young lady in the church, Karen, that wants to get married. I don't know if that's for us to think of, but anyway, I pray for Karen. I am happy to report good attendance, a good spirit, and unity at the church, too. A couple people were saved and will be baptized this month. I gave them their own copy of God's word, and they will be discipled. I remember five years ago during our last term when we began looking for an apartment. People approached us and said, this is a dangerous area, and you need to be very careful. While looking for this new apartment, we were told the very same thing. Even the realtor that helped us find the place was really hesitant and surprised that we wanted to live in such an area. Elections in Mexico will be just in just a few days. During the last elections, four years ago, over 150 political candidates were murdered. This has been another violent and deadly campaign season for many Mexican politicians as their rivals gain the victory when they eliminate the competition by assassination. As we told some that had, uh, as we had, as we told some that we had to have a COVID test in Mexico and return to the U.S., many laughed and said some pharmacies that do the test still help launder money for the for Chapo Guzman, the Sonola cartel leader who is currently in a U.S. jail in Colorado Springs. Whether it be a corrupt politician or a cartel leader or your average poor Mexican, the solution to all these is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you were on the list early last year and received our short email update every Monday night called Mike and Mary's Monday Message from the Mountains of Mexico City, I like that one, you will begin receiving those again later this month. If you are not on the list but would like to be, just email or text us and let us know. Thanks for everything. We are praying for you too. God bless. We are your servants for Jesus' sake. Okay, they sent a second letter since this letter, uh, which is when they had to go to the border. You need to hear this one. Okay. Dear pastors and friends, good afternoon. We just made it back to Mexico City safely. Thanks for your prayers. We did have to pay $100 tax at the border due to the quantity of our stuff, but that was more than fair. They usually let us enter without paying anything, but they could have charged us much more. Once we entered and got to the first red light, we were surrounded by several rough young men aggressively trying to get money from us, but we were able to get out of that. Mexican truck drivers have many accidents and we had to stay, we had to stay last night in a hotel because we were delayed because of many accidents. We had an 18-wheeler going real fast in the opposite direction oncoming lane of the interstate crash into the guardrail beside us directly in front of our van. I don't think the guardrail held that big truck, but I think it was your prayers in God's hand. Debris went flying and a huge plume of dirt immediately covered all lanes of traffic. I could not see nor could anyone. Thankfully, I didn't hit any large debris and none hit us. Furthermore, being able to see while moving, we hit no one and no one hit us. That was scary. Thank you again for praying. We are praying for you all. We are excited about this new term and we are looking forward to start sending you our weekly Monday updates near the end of this month. God bless you and take care. We are your servants for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Brother Mike Wallace and family in Mexico City. Appreciate the Wallaces and the work they're doing down there in Mexico City. What about Mexico City? Just under 22 million people live in Mexico City. Uh, hard to imagine. Uh, it really is. You know, Columbus has, I think, 1.7 million in the greater all the suburbs and everything around Columbus. Imagine something 20 times the size of this. And uh, that's what they're dealing with down there. And uh, continue to pray for them. And you never know what the missionaries face. And so uh, keep them faithfully in prayer, all right? Take your prayer guide tonight. Anybody need one? Uh, put your hand up and they'll get one to you. Uh, 
just get, I sure see the hand there. Get one to them. All right. We uh, praise reports. We got the lift chair for Gabe, and Gabe is home again, by the way. So praise the Lord for that. Continue to pray now for his recovery. And uh, again, we praise the Lord for the good testimony Sunday night uh, from the missions trip. And uh, the church requests, as usual, and uh, those on our health list. Um, I understand, uh, yeah, Carrie Smith is there. Keep her in prayer. Uh, she will be induced tomorrow evening. And uh, so. Uh, the baby will be on the way, so uh, keep them in prayer uh, as they have a safe delivery for everyone. The coming events, uh, remember Friday, uh, RU at 7 o'clock right here at the church. The RU National Conference is this week, and uh, James and Jessica Norman are there uh, at the conference representing our church, and uh, so pray for their safe return on Thursday, tomorrow. Uh, the RU Friday night here, um, of course, regular services Sunday uh, here. Don't forget Saturday. Uh, the graduation uh, open house for Abigail and for Nathan uh, in the fellowship hall from 1 to 4 p.m. All right, just uh, drop in and uh, have something to eat and wish them well and uh, then uh, play some volleyball and frisbee golf, all right, and eat a taco while you're at it, all right? You don't have to do all three at once, but, you know, you get the idea, all right? So that'll be a great time on Saturday for them. And uh, then, of course, uh, next Wednesday night, we'll have Commonwealth Baptist College here and the Voices of Revival. That'll be a great time, a men's quartet from the college there. And uh, after the service uh, that night, uh, we'll have some ice cream over in the fellowship hall in time to, to enjoy fellowshipping with the group from the college, all right? And uh, we look forward to that. Don't forget the July 2nd picnic out at Reed's. Uh, with fireworks on uh, that evening so uh, sign up for that there's a sign up sheet downstairs I know it's filling up uh, continue to sign up for that so we kind of plan on how many are coming and if you notice up at the top there uh, uh, Vivi Robinson who's uh, been coming to church here her husband Sean uh, a little short couple some of you might recognize them that way uh, he passed away this this week um, he had some serious heart and kidney issues and uh, for years and um, the Lord took him home earlier this week, and the services are still pending. We'll, we'll try to let you know when we know what's going to happen with the services there, but keep Vivi in your prayers. All right? We need you to pray for those in authority, and of course, these on our cancer list and the military list, and uh, these on our salvation list, the unreached people groups uh, still in the land of India. Can need you to especially also pray for not only Pastor Wilson and his group of pastors, but Pastor Nike and the Bible College there. Uh, please keep them in prayer. They, uh, they still need funds to finish the building up completely. And uh, he's asked us to pray with them about that. And so uh, lift that up in prayer, if you would, for God to provide for them and uh, finish that building out for, their, for them. They, they've started the, the school already, and uh, things are going well. So keep them in prayer. And then, of course, our missionaries highlighted by the Wallaces. Uh, in Mexico City. Also, downstairs, there's a uh, sign-up sheet for if you'd like to help in Vacation Bible School. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet down there in the different areas you might be wanting to help. Uh, just go ahead and get your name on there and uh, help us out during VBS. Coming up quickly, July 5 through 9, uh, 5 through 8 will be VBS, okay? So uh, sign-up sheet is down there, and uh, we need your help. So sign up and help us out that week, okay? All right, Dr. Yoder, I want you to come, if you would, please. I want to have you lead us in our prayer tonight for these requests. And as he leads us audibly, pray along with him silently. Would you please, Dr. Yoder? I wanted to mention this before we pray. Uh, oftentimes we say, um, what can we do to reach the unreached people groups? At the top of your missions list, you have a name there, Khotan in India. And that language... Telugu is the language that he speaks. So as we work with him, God may use him in a special way. But I would like for you to pray for him because his uh, family is severely going through the COVID right now. So keep him in your prayers. And let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being so kind to us and giving us the health to be here tonight to listen to teaching and preaching from the Word of God. We do thank you that you have given us the truth, that we do not have to wonder whether or not it has, the, the word of God has been infected from man, 
but that is still pure and true from Thee. We thank You for this. Lord, we know this is not the case for everyone throughout the world, but for whatever reason You have privileged us to have a copy of the Scriptures in our hands. And so we'd ask, Lord, as we hear the preaching and teaching tonight, that we would recognize it as such, that it is from You, and I pray that we would heed to the message. We do thank You for letting us be a church that is able to support many missionaries around the world. We thank you for the good report from the Wallaces and protecting them as they went back to Mexico City. I thank you, Lord, for the good report that we heard from our own people uh, on Sunday from the missions trip that they had in New Mexico. Lord, I pray that that fire that you have stirred in us would not uh, die out uh, before it has a chance to be put into practice. Lord, I pray that you would continue to be with uh, us here in Grove City as we do our part in fulfilling the Great Commission. We thank you, Lord, for letting us have a Bible Baptist Church here, and we thank you for the freedoms that we have here in America. Many of these things um, may uh, not be with us for a long period of time, so help us not to waste the times and the freedoms that you have given to us. Lord, we would ask that you would be with those in authority. Uh, Lord, you commanded us to pray for them. And Lord, we know that you lift up and put down authorities at your will. And so we would pray for our president and vice president and those that are in the cabinets and in positions of power. Also our governor and the mayors here in Grove City and Columbus, that you would guide them and help them. Lord, I pray that they would not forget or even ignore the scripture and different things that they encounter that is engraved on the walls and so forth uh, throughout many of our capitals. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them and that they would uh, turn to Christ before it is eternally too late. I do thank you, Lord, for our health to be here tonight. We know that that's not an automatic thing and that there's many of our church members that would like to be here but cannot. We pray that you would be with them and help them physically and be very close to them uh, spiritually and mentally so that they would not be depressed for their physical condition. Lord, we know that within the scope of eternity, this is just a small uh, amount of time, as we would say, a drop in a bucket compared to eternity, and help us to remember that that's what it is. But we do pray for our loved ones and friends that are sick at this time. We do think of this uh, Mrs. Robinson that has lost her husband and went home to be with thee. Lord, we know where he's at and we thank you for that good news, but we would ask for those that are grieving for the departure of uh, a loved one at this time. We would pray for those that are traveling to the uh, uh, conference in, in Rockford, that you would keep them safe, uh, that there would be no problems or accidents along the way and we thank you for uh, just being so kind to us as a church many of the churches around seem to be downsizing and yet Lord you've had uh, a great impact upon us during these uh, COVID months and made our church stronger because of Jesus Christ and we thank you once again for allowing us to hear a message from the Word of God uh, please bless tonight we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take just a minute, recognize anybody here tonight for the first time? Any first time guests? Everybody been here at least once? All right. Very good. All right. Take your songbook. We're going to sing again together. Number 207, 297. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my general cry 297 let's stand together to sing it normally an invitation hymn but it's a good hymn to learn and to remember and to sing let's sing it together tonight brother bob pass me not a gentle savior hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling do not pass me Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art called. 
We'll sing that last together when we get to that chorus. We'll have all the instruments drop out. We're going to sing that a cappella, all right? On that last together. Thou the spring of all my comfort, more than life to me. Whom have I on earth beside thee? Whom in heaven but thee? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others I'll work seated if you will. Ushers will come they'll receive our midweek offering and uh, give as God has blessed and prospered you. And let's pray for the offering tonight. Brother Chris lead us in our prayer please would you? Let's pray. Dear Lord thank you for letting us gather here at your church Lord. Uh, I want to um, thank for everyone for coming here, Lord. Um, bless the offering, Lord. Um, bless the service that is about to be given, Lord. Let there be no distraction, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and let's start at, John, at Psalm 12, and then with Psalm 12, uh, put a finger over in Matthew chapter 4, and we'll look at a verse over there as well. Psalm 12, two verses I'll read for you, verses 6 and 7, where the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words. Has silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them 
from this generation forever. And then notice Matthew 4 and verse 4, the words of Jesus. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the study of your word this evening, and particularly how we received your word and why we believe we have the words of God before us tonight. And so, Lord, I pray for your help as we go through this, and Holy Spirit of God, for your guidance and your help, as I, both as I give the lesson and as the people receive it tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us, and that we would rightly divide the word of truth this evening. We thank you for giving us your, your words, and I pray we would value them this evening because of this study tonight. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I don't know, uh, honestly, I don't know how many different translations of the Bible there are now in English. Do you know, Dr. Yoder? Over 300 different Bibles you can purchase. And if you ever go, I, I know, I don't know, there are any Christian bookstores around anymore. Uh, I think uh, Lifeway went out of business and all of that, or at least just went online, I guess. And um, But when you go in to try to buy a Bible, they'll try to steer you away from a King James Bible. And one of the frequent questions we get when people come here is they, they realize most of the time that they don't have the Bible that we're reading from. And so they want to get a Bible that they can read along with everyone from. And they ask frequently, why the King James Bible? Usually about once a year I try to go through this just to help folks who've recently come into the church. And also just a refresher for all of us to know uh, just why do we use the King James Bible and why do we hold to that. Uh, what I want you to understand is this. Every translation of the Bible is taken from one of two families of manuscripts. There's only two families of manuscripts. They're called the Alexandrian manuscripts because they were found in Alexandria, Egypt. And they're called the... Um, <laughs> now I lost my, lost my thought. Um, I call it the majority text, the Masoretic text, the... The, uh, what am I looking for? The received text, so to speak. It came out of Antioch in Syria. Okay, so the one line of manuscripts from An Alexandria in Egypt. The other line of manuscripts from Antioch in Syria. That's the only two there are. Okay, all the translations come from those two sources of manuscripts. Now, both of those locations, Alexandria, Egypt, and Antioch in Syria not only give us manuscripts, but they give us an ideology or a philosophy along with it. And you have to ask yourself, which location gives us our Bible and the perfect ideology to go along with it? Which is correct? And the answer to that, amazingly enough, can be found by studying the one source God has given to us. And that's what you're holding in your lap tonight, the Bible. You don't have to be a Greek scholar, don't have to be a Hebrew scholar, you don't have to be learned in all the ancient languages. God allowed us in His Word to see which source should be our source for the Bible. Now remember this important principle. All right, and, and if you take this message, and, and let me preface this too, I, I need to say this. This is not my original material. I originally, years and years ago, uh, Dr. Sam Gipp taught this, uh, and I think you might even have it in one of his uh, books. Um, and I picked it up and continued to teach it in the church that I pastored. And, uh, and I think he got it from somebody, one of his friends, so I don't know who originally came up with it, but I'm, I'm not taking credit where it's not mine. But it is, it, it is truth, and what we have to establish right away, if you share this with other people, is you establish this fact first. Is the Bible our final authority in all matters of faith and practice? 
Yes, it is. The Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Okay? In other words, we, we do something, there ought to be a Bible reason why we do it. If we're not doing it and there's no Bible reason for it, then why are we doing it? All right? Uh, there needs to be a Bible reason. The Bible's the final authority. It's not what I think. It's not what I'm comfortable with. It's not what I like. It's what does the Bible say. Okay? The Bible's the final authority. And so, therefore, we only need to see what the Bible says about these sources of manuscripts. All right? Let's start. And, and some of you will know this, and some of you are familiar with this. But let's start with Egypt. Okay? Egypt and the Bible. Now, when you study the Bible, there's a fundamental rule that is followed in Bible study. And that is, one of them is called the law of first mention. What the law of first mention means is that uh, when something is mentioned for the first time in the Bible, and if it's mentioned in a good light, then generally it will be mentioned in a good light throughout the Bible. However, if the first time that is mentioned in the Bible it is mentioned in a bad light or a bad connotation, then generally it will be mentioned in a bad connotation throughout the Bible. That's why it's called the law of first mention. And so let's look, with that in mind, let's look at Egypt. The first time Egypt is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 12. So if you look there with me, Genesis chapter 12, and we begin in verse number 10. Genesis 12 and verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he came near to enter into Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So, this is the first mention of Egypt. Abraham and his wife are heading there because of a famine. And Abraham has a fear. What's Abraham's fear? Yeah, you're a good looking woman. They're going to kill me and take you. Okay? And, and so, I mean, think about it, Brother Phillips. If I said, hey, i got a great spot for you to take your wife on a vacation. Okay? There's only one little problem. Okay? It's a beautiful area. You'll love it. I think your wife will love it. There's one problem. They may kill you and, and keep your wife. Okay? Now, that may be a deal breaker, huh? All right? And you may say, well, I don't think I want to go there. All right? You would admit that's a bad connotation, would you not? That's not a place I'd want to go, and I certainly wouldn't want to take my wife there. Not, not exactly a positive context. So the law of first mention, the first mention of Egypt is a negative mention. All right? But we're not done there. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Just keep going to your right there in your Bible, Genesis and Exodus. Exodus 1. Notice the Jews, we know, are in, in Egypt now, and they're, they're slaves there. And notice what it says in verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them to serve was with rigor. All right. So we see now they're slaves in Egypt. And, and they're made to serve under dire conditions and bad conditions. You read a little further down, and you find out that they had commanded that as soon as the women gave birth and they saw that it was a male, what were they supposed to do? Kill them, all right? Uh, abortion was going on, all right? And uh, that's the second mention, or, the, or the, another mention here of Egypt, and again, a negative connotation. But now let's go to Exodus 20. And in Exodus 20, you see what God's, God himself says about Egypt. This is not anybody's commentary. This is God speaking. Exodus 20, you recognize Exodus 20 is a place where God gives the Ten Commandments. In verse 1, it says, And God spake all these words, saying, 
I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the, what church? House of bondage. Okay? A uh, good thing or bad thing? Uh, not nice. If I called your place a house of bondage, uh, you wouldn't consider that a compliment. All right? That's a negative comment. This time, from the very mouth of God. That's God's comment on it. But now let's see what Moses calls it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Move ahead to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we see what Moses' comment is about Egypt. Moses, in, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 20. Would you look there, please? Deuteronomy 4, 20. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. Moses calls it an iron furnace. Again, not a real positive comment. Now I want you to keep going in Deuteronomy to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. God is instructing Israel now about their future when they will have a king. Let's look first at verse 15. It says, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. To the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. And he talks about multiplying wives and such. But he reminds them here, uh, you're not going to go back to Egypt even to multiply horses. I don't want you to go there even to get horses. That's interesting. Now, I want you to go over all the way to the New Testament, to the last book of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 11. This is tribulation time on the earth. We are not here. The church is gone. God is dealing with Israel here. And he's talking specifically about his two witnesses that he has during the tribulation time. And these witnesses are killed. He gives, God allows the beast power to kill them. In verse 8 of Revelation 11, the Bible says, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city which spiritually is called Sodom and what? Where also our Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Where was the Lord crucified? In Jerusalem. And now when God wants to speak pretty disparagingly of Jerusalem and derogatorily of Jerusalem, He calls it Sodom and Egypt. I mean, if you're going to be linked together with something, Sodom probably isn't the place you want to be linked together with. And here he's, if God is thinking of maybe some of the worst description he could give to the city of Jerusalem, and he calls them Sodom and Egypt. So again, I think that brief little study, and most of us knew that already, is the Bible has a very negative context or negative connotation when it comes to Egypt. Amen? You understand that? All right. Now, let's, let's talk about Alexandria in Egypt. Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 6. That's where we find the first mention of Alexandria in the Bible. Acts, chapter 6. Most of you recall, in Acts 6, the early church is, is uh, choosing deacons. And they're having the, some widows were being neglected in the daily ministration of food. And so they, they, the, the apostles said, we shouldn't leave the word of God in prayer to serve tables. So let's choose out some men among you. And he said, you're choosing out, verse 3, choose out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and in the ministry of the word. Now, the saying pleased all multitude, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. All right, verse 6, he says, Whom they set before the apostles, 
When they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now watch. Now by the way, let look at me. Stephen, good guy, bad guy. I think he's a pretty good guy. Uh, the Bible has some really, really good things to say about him, okay? Now look at verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia. And what are they doing? Disputing with Stephen. They're arguing with the fellow who the Bible said was full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, Right? Stephen, full of faith and power, and did great wonders and miracles among the people, and they're arguing with him. They're disputing with him. Would that put them on the good side or the bad side? That'd be a bad side. That's not, a good, that's not the side you want to be on. That's not a good mention. Now let's go to the second mention of Alexandria. That's in Acts 18. Acts 18. This is where we meet a preacher from Alexandria. Notice with me verse number 24. Acts 18 and verse 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took, unto him, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass through into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, he helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So here's Apollos, comes from Alexandria, and though he was fervent in spirit, and though the Bible says here he was uh, uh, taught diligently, mighty in the Scriptures, but all he knew was the baptism of John. He wasn't preaching Jesus Christ. He was only up to John. He had, he had some incomplete Bible knowledge, some incomplete Bible teaching. And, and so uh, Aquila and Priscilla recognize it right away. And, and, and they, they take him aside and they explain to him, Christ has come. Christ has died on the cross. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Not by baptism of repentance. It's by grace through faith in Christ. And so expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now to Apollos' credit, he took it. And then he began to preach again, just as much fervency and with as much power. But now he's preaching that Jesus is Christ. And so he's preaching the gospel now. So Alexandria is associated with incomplete Bible teaching. You'll understand why in just a little bit. All right? So that's our second mention. Now here's the third mention. You go to Acts 27. Some of you might remember this from our Sunday school journey through Acts. In Acts 27, Paul's been arrested, you know, and he's appealed to Caesar. And so God has said, you're going to go to Rome and you'll be there to, to, to appeal to Caesar. And in Acts 27, he's going to get a ship to have to go to Rome. And verse number 6 says that there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So the ship that's going to take Paul to Rome, where he's eventually going to have his head cut off, is from Alexandria. Isn't that ironic? You say, what a coincidence. Well, maybe not. Let's look in Acts chapter 28. Most of you know, what happens in Acts 27 to that ship? Yeah, a big, big storm and end up... Uh, running it into the, the ground, and it tore to pieces. And so they spend about three months on this island of Melita in Acts 28. 
And finally, after three months, they, they wait for a ship to come. And Acts 28, verse 11. And after three months, we departed in a ship of another one comes by. Wonder where this ship's from. Alexandria again. Which had wintered in the isle whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And, and it takes Paul on to Rome and eventually his execution in Rome. So all four references to Alexandria are negative. So honestly, you look at just what the Bible says, and you say, what, what, what do you think the references of Alexandria, Egypt are? Good or bad? You have to admit they're bad. Never in a good light. Now, what I was going to say earlier was this. Alexandria also was a center of education and philosophy. There's a school of the scriptures founded there by a man named Pantaeus, or Pantaeus, if I'm saying that word right, his name right. He was also a philosopher. Here's the problem. He believed the Bible should be interpreted both philosophically and allegorically. In other words, truth is relative, not absolute. So he didn't believe the Bible was infallible. When we say we look at the Bible allegorically, what it meant to him and what he was teaching was men like Adam and Noah and Moses and David, they weren't really real. See? They're, they they just existed in Jewish poetry. They weren't actual people. They were just made up figures for the Bible. Now, he was succeeded in that uh, by Clement of Alexandria and eventually by a fellow named Origen. O-R-I-G-E-N. It was Origen or Oregon who, who deceived by education and philosophy began to alter the manuscripts that were delivered to him. He's the father of all those who say the Bible has mistakes and mistranslations. He's the father of them. So he began to change the manuscripts. And again, we, he believed the Bible needed to be corrected. And again, if you just believe it's allegorical and philosophical, you're not concerned about the words. You're just concerned about the truth that comes across. But here's the problem. What we started out reading tonight. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now if he says we're supposed to live by every word, then we have to figure out where, where is that every word. Did he just mean every truth? Or did he really mean every word? When he says that he'll preserve the words of the Lord are pure words. Not the word of the Lord, singular. Pure word, it's words. And so there's a problem not just in the manuscripts, but in the philosophy behind those manuscripts. When you believe you can correct... See, we don't think we ought to correct the Bible. We believe the Bible ought to correct us. And that's, that's how we look at God's word. And so... That's Alexandria, and that's Egypt. Now, let's, let's look in your Bible at Antioch. Let's go again to Acts chapter 6. Again, ironically enough, the first mention of Alexandria is also in the same chapter as the first mention of Antioch. Again, it has to do with the choosing of the, 12, or, or the seven deacons, the first deacons that were chosen. Verse 5. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. You know what's interesting? It doesn't say where any of those other fellows are from. Only one. Nicholas was a proselyte of Antioch. Only mentions one man's hometown. Now remember who these men were. Were they just nice guys? Just personable guys? 
just successful businessmen? No. What was it? Choose you out, verse 3, seven men, honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. So what do we know about Nicholas? He was honest. He was good, full of the Holy Ghost and of wisdom. Right? He was one of the seven, so he was chosen. So we know that about him. So if that's the first mention of Antioch, do we look at it in a good light or a bad light? That would be a good light, wouldn't it? Okay? Now let's go to Acts chapter 11. Are you all right? Doing okay? Acts chapter 11. Verse number 19. Notice with me. Now they were scattered, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So Christians are scattered, and they're preaching the gospel, and they come to some of the Grecians here in Antioch, and the Spirit of God is working, and the Bible says that a great number believed and turned to the Lord. A great number were saved in Antioch. One of the first great Gentile awakenings took place in Antioch. All right? Good, good thing or bad thing? Obviously a good thing. Okay? But let's keep reading now. Look at verse 22. Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth, who church? Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. So Barnabas, the son of encouragement, they sent him down to encourage these new believers and Barnabas does a fantastic job. Uh, so much of a great job that it says that, that much people are now added to the Lord. And folks who were saved are now cleaving to the Lord with all their heart. Barnabas does a tremendous job. And through that ministry of encouragement, much people are being added to the Lord. Is that a good thing? That's a very good thing. Okay? Now let's keep reading. Look at verse 25 and 26. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto, where church? Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So Barnabas sees what's going on here, and he says this would be a great place for Saul. And so he goes to find Saul in Tarsus. But remember, where did Barnabas come from? Where was he sent from to go to Antioch? Where was he? Jerusalem. They said, Jerusalem. But when he got Saul, he didn't take Saul back to Jerusalem. He brought him to Antioch. He said, here's where, we're going. Here, here's where it's happening, man. It's happening in Antioch. And so they stay there, and they, they teach the folks. And they're, so much so, the whole year they taught them, and they were called Christians, or Christ-like ones, first in Antioch. You, 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 the believers were called Christians there first. Our spiritual forefathers are not Jerusalem. Our spiritual forefathers are Antioch. That's where, uh, you know, for Americans, you go to Plymouth Rock. Well, for Christians, we go to Antioch. That's where, that's where we drive our stake down. And so, they were believers first there. Now, I want you to notice something else that happened. Notice verse number 27. Sometimes we, we go right past this when we're reading. And in those days came prophets from unto uh, there's a shift here, isn't there? Now, even the prophets leave Jerusalem, and where do they go? They go to Antioch. There's a shift here, because J Jerusalem now is sort of spiritually abandoned. And, and because, remember, when they all scattered abroad upon the persecution in Acts chapter 8, they all scattered abroad except the apostles. They stayed there. They should have scattered like everyone else, because that's what Jesus told them to do. But they stayed there, and now Jerusalem is dying. In fact, how do you know? Because look at verse 29 and 30. 
Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. That's, that's the church in Jerusalem. Which also they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So the church in Antioch takes a relief offering to try to help the saints in Jerusalem, the ones that are left there. And they're sending an offering back there. So again, we see the, the moving of God and the working of God in Antioch. But then let's look at Acts chapter 13. Notice verse number 1. Now they were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, says Barnabas and Simeon. It lists them there, the last one being Saul. As they ministered the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence sailed to Cyprus. Here's the calling of the first missionaries. When the first missionaries are called by God and sent forth to the mission field, what church do they come out of? The church at Antioch. The church at Antioch has the first missionaries, not the church at Jerusalem. You find out when they're done with their first missionary journey, they report back to the church at Antioch. When they get done with the second missionary journey, they report back to the church at Antioch. Everything originates and returns to Antioch. Now, Antioch also had a school of the Scriptures, much like Alexandria did. This was founded by a man named Lucian, L-U-C-I-A-N. He was noted, Lucian was noted for his mistrust of philosophy. His school magnified the authority of Scripture. He said the Bible should be taken literally, not figuratively, as the philosophers in Alexandria believed. So let's review. Egypt, a place where they may kill you and steal your wife. A place where the Jews were in slavery. A place God called a house of bondage. A place Moses referred to as an iron furnace. A place where God told the king of Israel was not to go to get horses, multiply horses. And in Revelation, when God denounces Jerusalem, he calls it Sodom and Egypt. Alexandria, they were Jews from Alexandria disputing with spirit-filled, full of faith, Stephen. You had the incomplete Bible teaching of Apollos. You had a ship taking Paul to Rome and it's destroyed in a storm. And that ship was from Alexandria. They wait three months on a deserted island until another ship comes by and it too is from Alexandria. There was a school of scriptures there that taught the Bible is an allegory and is to be interpreted philosophically. The truth is relative. There are no absolutes. And they were not afraid to delete verses from the Bible. You, on the other hand, you look at Antioch, and you have one of the first deacons, Nicholas, coming from Antioch. You have, after the persecution, a great number saved in Antioch. You have Barnabas going to Antioch and then finding Saul and bringing him back to spend a year there at Antioch teaching the believers there and they were called Christians first in Antioch then we saw the prophets God's prophets move from Jerusalem to Antioch then we saw the Christians send an offering of relief back to the church in Jerusalem to help them then the first missionaries were called from the church in Antioch and when Paul and Barnabas report back from their missionary journey they report back to the church in Antioch and then we said the school of the scriptures was there, which magnified the authority of God's word, that the Bible was to be taken literally and not figuratively. Now, if God did not want the king or Israel to go back to Egypt, even to multiply horses, do you think he'd want them to go there to get a Bible? Let me ask you a question. If those are the two sources, and there are only two sources where the Bible manuscripts come from, where would you go to get your Bible? You'd go to Antioch. All modern translations, 
All 300 some that are out there come from Alexandria, Egypt. One, one Bible comes from Antioch. And that's the King James Bible. Don't even be deceived. The new King James isn't just an update of the King James. They use Alexandrian manuscripts. Only one comes from, from Antioch. Now, you don't have a King James 1611 in your hand. Most of you could not read it if you did. Okay? If you ever, how many of you have seen a 1611 King James Bible? All right? The, the letters are different. The, the, it, you have to really know what you're doing. And so they were, there were many spelling changes. Not word changes, but spelling changes. There, was, there, was a lot of, there wasn't a lot of uniform way of spelling words. But that began to come into being. And what, what the final, what most of us have in our hands as a King James Bible is a 1769 King James Bible. That's the... That's where the, the, most of the spelling was all unified, and that's why most all the Bibles will be the same. There's still uh, some. I think I had an old Cambridge one time that uh, in the book of Acts where the, man, the lame man got healed in Acts 3, and his feet and ankle bones received strength, and it's still spelled ankle, A-N-C-L-E, ankle. You know what I mean? Instead of A-N-K-L-E is how we spell it. See, just spelling changes not word changes, just grammatical changes. But compare that to 60,000 alterations of the text. That's in the New King James Version. And that's from the first edition to the fifth edition. Now, and... and, and <laughs> I was, I, I'm looking for my note here about how many changes have been. Yeah, the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, is 90,000 words shorter than the King James. Many of you know, notice verses will be missing. Uh, if you notice, a lot of the new versions, they don't, they don't have it laid out like your King James Bible does. They put it in paragraph form. So you don't notice if a, if a verse is not there or if it's changed or shortened. You don't notice it as much. Uh, all of them get compared to that. You say, well, why, why do they keep coming up with, with, with new Bibles all the time? Because it makes money. Let me, let, me, let me also add this. There's one Bible that has no copyright on it. It's the King James Bible. Now, if you have a study Bible, if you have a study Bible, there, then there's a copyright on the notes of that Bible. You can't look up it down. But this one here is just the, the Word of God. I could lay that down in the copy machine and just copy it all out and, and, and hand them out. There's no law against that. But you can't do that with any of the modern Bibles because they've copyrighted it. Uh, because they're money makers. Uh, that's sad. But let's... Uh, Let's just kind of say it like it is. They change the words. But you understand, if the philosophy is that it's allegorical, it's just the truth, it's not the words, then what's it matter if I change things? What's it matter if I move things around? It doesn't matter. But if we believe that we should not live by bread alone, but by every word, then where, where is that every word Bible? Where is that? There's got to be in every word Bible somewhere. And if it's, if you say, well, it's in the myriad of Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. Well, if you don't know Greek or Hebrew, what are you reading? You, don't, you, know, you have no ability to do that. But God has preserved His Word, and we believe He's preserved it in the English language in the King James Bible because of the source of Antioch. I know that you'll hear people say, well, those manuscripts in Alexandria are older. They were discovered later, but they, they dated back before these other manuscripts. And, and there's a reason for that. By the way, they found them in Alexandria, Egypt, in a wastebasket in a monastery. That's true. 
And they were, they were older because they were not used. They were rejected by the believers. Obviously, as believers would use the, the, the paper and use the scriptures they had, they would become worn and they would need to be recopied. They would need to be written out again. And then as the other ones got unusable, they're replaced. And so they're used. And so they're not necessarily older doesn't necessarily mean better in this particular case. So let's see. I, I, I go on this. It's awful confusing to look at 300 different translations of the Bible. And it's awful difficult when, when they don't agree. One says one thing, one says another. Well, then which one's right? They both can't be right. So which is right? See, then that's confusion. And I'm pretty sure there's a verse in the Bible that says God is not the author of confusion. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, he says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and 300 Bibles. Of course not. There has to be one word of God. And God has given us his word and preserved it for us. And he's not the author of confusion. In 2011, the King James Bible celebrated 400 years. No other Bible has been as blessed as the King James Bible. A lot of the missionary movement of the 1800s can be traced back to the King James Bible, no matter what church it was, whether it's a Methodist church or Presbyterian church or any other uh, kind of churches. Uh, it's had a great effect on world missions. Now, I think I put in your notes for tonight the translations of the English Bible. You had Tyndale's New Testament in 1526. Do you have that there? You have Coverdale's Bible in 1535. You have Matthew's Bible. These are all English translations of the Bible in 1537. You have the Great Bible in 1539. The Geneva Bible, 1560. The Bishop's Bible in 1568. And then finally, the King James Bible in 1611. That's the seventh translation, English translation, uh, the Bible into the English language. You recall Psalm 12 that we read earlier? The words of the Lord are pure words. Has silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times? Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. What's he preserving? What are them? Yeah, words. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. How long? Forever. Forever. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, let's not just believe the Bible. Let's live the Bible. Okay? Let's not be, listen, let's not have, let's not be bad attitude Bible believers. Okay, don't you dare! I we had somebody and they don't go to our church anymore. Uh, we had somebody walk in and they didn't have a King James Bible, and you know somebody approached him and said, "What are you doing with that garbage under your arm?" You do that, and I'm liable to slap you into next week. That is not not the spirit you want to have. Hey, I I'm going to tell you something. You may be surprised at this. I'd rather have somebody who has a worn-out NIV or a worn-out living Bible by reading it, and weeping over it, and wanting to know God than someone who has a nice, shiny King James where the pages are still sticking together because you never open it, but you're, you're saying, bless God, I got the Bible. Okay? Uh, we want to we wanna have the Word of God, but we want to have the right spirit. There's, there's a lot of folks, they... They, they just, listen, they don't know. And, and, and I, if they love the Word of God and they don't have a King James Bible, ask, you can ask, and sometimes they'll ask, why do you use the King James? They say, well, I'd like to talk to you about that. And then you say, you know what? 
Will you agree as you sit down that the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, well, then remember that because you, you'll remind him of that when you get done. <laughs> that you said the Bible will be our final authority because it's plain as day, right in the Scripture. Where our Bible came from, and that's, that's why we hold to the King James Bible because the source it came from is, and, and that's where God has preserved his word for us. He inspires it, and then he preserves it. I, I don't understand where people believe in inspiration if they do not believe in preservation. What good did it do to inspire your word if you're not going to preserve it? We're not going to keep it. If, God, if God's able to use those 40 different men over 1,500 or 1,600 years to put the Bible together, and inspire those men, I believe he's just big enough to preserve it and to keep his words for us. And, and that's why we, we don't believe it to be the words of men or the words of a man. We believe it to be the words of God. And we hold copies in our hand tonight. So listen, let's read it. Let's study it. Let's memorize it that we might obey it. Let's live the Bible. Let's, let's make sure that we're not just talking about it and saying how great it is and our life doesn't show it. If this really is God's words, let's treat it like that. And let's let it have its power and effect in our life like we ought to. All right? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and thank you, Lord, for everyone's kind attention tonight. And Lord, we want to thank you again for your graciousness and your goodness to us and allowing us to have copies of your word tonight. And Lord, we're well aware that there's nearly half this world that does not have a copy of your word in their language. Lord, I, I pray that we would do our part to help get the gospel to them. But Lord, those of us who are privileged and those of us in this room certainly are, I pray we would not neglect your word. We would be diligent and it would be a priority that we would be students of the only book you've ever written. And we would cherish it. We would love it. And we would live it in our lives. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord, and make us mindful that you go with us as we leave this place tonight. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing Every Day with Jesus is Sweeter Than the Day Before. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and He's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up for choir.